Let your valor as a soldier and your conduct be an inspiration to your comrades and an honor to your country. General of the American Expeditionary Force, World War I, John J. Pershing, August 10, 1917. October 9, 2018 marks the 100th anniversary of the death of Keesler Air Force Base's namesake, 2nd Lieutenant Samuel Reeves Keesler, Jr. As we recognize this occasion, we will explore the life of Lieutenant Keesler and why we honor his legacy. Lieutenant Keesler was born in Greenwood, Mississippi on April 11, 1896 to his father, General Samuel Reeves Keesler, Sr. and mother, Charlotte Parrish Keesler. Lieutenant Keesler was the second child of seven growing up at his family home, Cottonlandia. He and his six siblings were afforded some luxury having a father who not only was the general in the local army reserve post, but also a cotton broker. Lieutenant Keesler distinguished himself throughout his high school years in his athletic ability. Despite his small stature, being five foot seven inches and weighing 150 pounds, he was selected as the most well-rounded athlete at Jefferson Davis graded school in his junior and senior years. He also maintained a high grade point average throughout school, graduating as a salutatorian on May 26, 1913. On September 5, 1913, he started Davidson College, Davidson, North Carolina, where his athletic and academic abilities quickly allowed him to excel in his fraternity, the student council, the athletic association, along with many other clubs. The fates were kind when they sent to our class one of Sam's caliber, for there were few like him. Despite his light weight and diminutive stature, his prowess on the football field will be long remembered. His easy, courteous manner marks him a gentleman of the true Old Southern type. While his popularity and confidence placed in his ability is shown by his position as the president of the student body. The 1917 Davidson College Yearbook. On June 28, 1914, Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie were assassinated. In July, Austria-Hungary blamed the Serbians. They had reason to believe that the Serbian Black Hand had hired the Yugoslavian assassins to kill Ferdinand and started to mobilize against them. Russia, in support of Serbia, mobilized against Austria-Hungary. After demanding that Russia stand down, Germany mobilized and declared war on Russia. In August, Germany marched on Luxembourg, which brought France and England into the war to protect Belgium. After continued blockades, the sinking of American merchant ships by German U-boats, and negotiations with Mexico about going to war with America, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson declared war on Germany April 2, 1917, putting the American Expeditionary Force, led by General John Pershing, on the Allied side. On May 13, 1917, the 21-year-old Lieutenant Kiesler graduated from Davidson College and postponed his plans to become a teacher. Instead, he joined the war effort and newly formed U.S. Army Aviation Corps. He attended Reserve Officer Training School at Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia, where he learned the basics of drilling and marching, and to Chickamauga Park, Chattanooga, Tennessee, to learn how to handle the weapon. Afterward, on August 15, 1917, Lieutenant Kiesler was commissioned into the U.S. Army Reserves as a second lieutenant. At his first post on Camp Jackson in Columbia, South Carolina, he studied psychology of leadership and applied to be an observation officer. By December 1917, Sam was at the School for Aerial Observers at Fort Sill in Lawton, Oklahoma, learning how to fly, shoot from a plane, and perform aerial reconnaissance. In March of 1918, Lieutenant Kiesler was assigned to Field 2 in Hempstead, New York, and on March 14th, he boarded a ship to France. Having learned the basics of aerial reconnaissance at Fort Seal, Lieutenant Kiesler was sent to the 2nd Artillery Observation School as part of the American Expeditionary Force to be trained by the war-hardened French and English for the logistics of aerial combat. The 100 Days Offensive started on the 8th of August, 1918, was the last great offensive for the Allies, with the final assault being on the Meuse-Argonne Offensive on September 26, 1918, launching their attacks from Verdun, France, up the Meuse River into the Belgian frontier. 
In September of 1918, Lieutenant Kiesler is finally posted with the American Expeditionary Forces 24th Aero Squadron in the Verdun section of France on the Western Front, a little nervous but ready to, quote, send the Huns back to their hole. On September 14th, Lieutenant Kiesler strapped into his modified Air Corps DH-4 bomber to go on his first mission over Germany to take photos of the enemy's movements and structures. On that mission, his flight lost two planes along with their crew. Lieutenant Kiesler's plane was also hit and started smoking to the point of immediate withdrawal. The next few weeks saw Lieutenant Kiesler on more missions with varying degrees of danger, but always making it back to base at one piece. On October 8, 1918, the squadron commander, Lieutenant Maury Hill, sent three 24th Aero Squadron pilots up to see Colonel William Mitchell, Chief of Air Services of the First Army. One of the pilots was First Lieutenant Harold Riley. Because Lieutenant Riley's observer was too ill to fly, he chose Lieutenant Kiesler to be his observer. Lieutenant Riley had worked with Lieutenant Kiesler before and respected him. They flew over to First Army Headquarters with the two other pilots and their observers. Colonel Mitchell led them to the Verdun section of a large war map on the wall to show them that the military drive on the American side of the Meuse River was progressing well, but that the French side, to the east, was creating an opening for the Germans due to the slow pace of French advancement. Colonel Mitchell needed to know it lied in the Bois de Consolvois, a heavily wooded area that lay in front of the French so they could advance and, if necessary, prepare artillery. The mission went well, and Lieutenant Riley turned his plane around, heading home, when he noticed that four Fokker aeroplanes had positioned themselves in the sun in between Lieutenant Riley's plane and the French border. Having only one choice, Lieutenant Riley headed straight for them, hoping that if he could fly past them, the sun would hinder the Fokkers from pursuit, making it hard to see them flee. As they flew under the Fokkers, one came straight at them in a dive, firing his machine guns. Lieutenant Kieser opened fire with the rear guns, taking the Fokker down. The other three Fokkers fired and managed to cripple one aileron and take out the rudder and elevation control. Lieutenant Kiesler kept firing the mounted gun, even after they crashed. Lieutenant Riley had to pull Lieutenant Kiesler out of the wreckage because he had lost the use of his legs due to the six shots he had suffered in his chest and abdomen. Lieutenant Riley carried Lieutenant Kiesler to the edge of a small clearing to escape the constant bombardment of the three remaining Fokkers. As they cleared the wreckage of their DH-4 bomber, Lieutenant Kiesler was shot a seventh time in the hip from 5.15 until 12 that night, when we reached a dressing station, Lieutenant Kiesler received no medical attention, and although he must have suffered terribly, he showed wonderful self-control and won the admiration of all the German soldiers who came to look at him. Lieutenant Kiesler died the following noon. Second Lieutenant Kiesler's conduct was a grand demonstration of the morale of our air service, and I hope it will not go unrecognized. First Lieutenant H.W. Riley, 24th Aero Squadron. Second Lieutenant Samuel Reeves Kiesler Jr. strived to be his best up until he died on October 9, 1918. On August 25, 1941, Army Air Corps Station No. 8 was officially designated Kiesler Army Airfield in his honor. The airfield became Kiesler Air Force Base January 13, 1948. Today, Kiesler Air Force Base is home to a workforce of more than 11,000 and training 21,000 students annually. The base also hosts the Hurricane Hunters of the 403rd Wing, who help forecast the destructive power of hurricanes. The base contains $4.75 billion in assets and brings $1.57 billion to the surrounding communities in adjusted economic impact. I never saw a fellow who was more anxious to do his work well. A half-done mission didn't satisfy Sam. He wanted results and wasn't content to be excused because a pilot had mismanaged the mission or the camera had gone bad. Perhaps Sam might have come back from the last mission if he had not wanted to do his best. First Lieutenant Stuart Gilchrist, U.S. Air Force.
Thank you.